I'm going to talk about financial support for Paul, uh, which arises from honest questions. I, I take that to mean a request for teaching about it, and so let's just go teach about it. I try to take a fresh look at things in Scripture and let it dictate what it is that we ought to be and to do. And uh, this is the result of the current fresh look, I guess, um, is that uh, there are uh, some fellows called the Brothers who came from Macedonia. And they are not a musical group. They are the deacons, probably, of Philippi. Um, they are... I guess the, the, they're going to be the central actors in the lesson here with regard to financial support for Paul. Um, one thing that you need to know if you don't already, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to show that. Um, here we go. Is it showing up? It is. If you're not red, green, colorblind, you can see the red, the red dot here. Um, the region called Macedonia is north of Greece. Greece, uh, Achaia, extends down uh, this coastline here to Corinth, and et cetera, et cetera. But this region, Macedonia, is uh, a little bit north of Greece, due north of Greece, and it contains the cities Thessalonica, and Philippi, there were other cities, but for our purposes, these are the two cities that we care about. Macedonia is talking about, if you say the brothers who came from Macedonia, you're talking about the church at Philippi or the church at Thessalonica, or maybe both. That's what's happening there, which I think bears pointing out, because that's where this stuff is coming from in the current lesson. Now, if you turn over with me, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, that's where we'll start. But it's good to be reminded, I, you know, I never used to use maps, but um, I've started looking at them at least to get an idea of where these places are. And I find that oftentimes it's very useful to... Uh, to do that, to find things like this. And uh, the first topic here in 2 Corinthians 8 is the famine in Judea. You may recall that it's recorded in the book of the Acts that a famine arose in Judea and that the brethren uh, determined, I guess independently or separately, but whatever, that the brethren everywhere all over the world determined to send relief to the saints in Judea. So there's a famine and, and the, you know, some of the apostles still living there were being um, provided for by the churches in foreign lands. And it's about this that Paul writes the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 8. And Corinth is in Achaia, that's in Greece. They're south, due south of Macedonia. And he passed through Philippi and Thessalonica on his way down into Achaia. So he has left Macedonia. He has entered Greece. He's been preaching with them. In fact, he's already done this. He's already written another letter. This is the second letter to them. But to give you an idea of the time frame and uh, the sequence of events when he says this to them. In 2 Corinthians 8, it's 1 through 4. He said, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. So the, Mac the Macedonians, um, the churches of Macedonia, it's talking about Thessalonica and Philippi. <coughs> These churches... Uh, Paul writes to, to Corinth about, he writes to Greece saying, you know, Macedonia has done this thing. This wonderful thing has happened there. It's the grace of God given among those churches. 
What is this wonderful thing? Well, the wonderful thing is this, that Despite this severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So one of the things that we learn about the church there is that the grace of God among them is, you know, palpable because they had an abundance of joy and an extreme poverty. They had so much joy in the Lord because of their forgiveness, because they were redeemed, because they were Christians, and so much thankfulness back to Israel, where all these things have come from. Uh, Even as we talked about earlier today, to the Jews were given the oracles of God, Romans 3, 2. Every bit of our salvation through the words of God has come through Israel. We owe them a great debt of thanks. And the churches of Macedonia were no exception. They, because of that abundance of joy and because of the grace of God resting among them, they gave money to go down to Judea to relieve them in the time of the famine. But what you're seeing here about this, the grace of God, not just that they were generous, not just that they were willing to give, not just that they themselves had obtained his grace and were forgiven, but that they were doing so in extreme poverty. They have an abundance of joy and they have an extreme poverty. But the result of their joy combined with their poverty and the grace of God is an overflow in the wealth of generosity. What do we mean? We mean what Paul said, they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord. They chose to do this. Paul did not press them. (laughs) Um, It's not even clear that Judea asked for it. I think they did not. But they gave of their own accord, it says, according to their means, as Paul can testify, which he can testify because he was there. He met them. He knows their circumstances and beyond their means. So first of all, they're impoverished in the flesh, but they're full of the grace of God and they're full of joy. And because of that, they have a wealth of generosity giving, you know, unstoppably. The fact that they're impoverished is not preventing them from sending to the saints in Judea. They're unstoppable. They gave according to their means and beyond their means. That's what Paul is saying. As I can testify, they gave more than you probably could have expected from them. You know, perhaps they took out loans or something. I don't know. But the testimony of the Holy Spirit by the hand of Paul is that they gave more than they could afford to give which is not hard if they live in poverty, as he said that they do. So they are unstoppable. The famine in Judea meant, you know, everybody suffered, but the children of God suffered less because the other children of God had it in their hearts to not let that happen. When they were able to do so and when they were not able to do so, what it says. They were beyond their means. Now there's another famine that nobody talks about, but except for me, I do it. I admit I'm I'm guilty. But there's another famine, a famine in Corinth, right? It's recorded, especially in 1 Corinthians 9. This famine is a spiritual one. The Apostle Paul, as we mentioned earlier, traveled through Philippi and then Thessalonica as he followed the shoreline, going through Macedonia, headed south towards Achaia, Greece. When he lands, you know, that's where he's 
speaking with Corinth, we were speaking with Athens, you know, these places. When he goes to Achaia, he doesn't accept any payment for preaching. Everywhere in Achaia, he doesn't allow them to pay him, refuses to take the income. Where did he get the income from? Well, that's what we're looking at. He got it from Thessalonica and Philippi, from Macedonia. They sent him support to preach the gospel in Greece and Achaia, where he was not accepting any money, and there's reasons for that. We'll talk about it. But the thing that I noticed this time through the study is this is a famine because they are not supporting the gospel. They're refusing to support it. And he, his needs were being met by Thessalonica and Philippi. His needs were being met by another country, not, not Greece. He preached there free of charge. And free was too expensive for them. That was too much for them. because he was being called out on the carpet for accepting support, right? That's 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus? Aren't you my workmanship in the Lord? And the third verse, this is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we have no right to eat and drink? He's making a defense to those who would examine him. You see what this is? He's there, he's working, but he's too expensive, even though they're not even paying him. Thessalonica, uh, Philippi is paying him. Preaching is work, you know. Support is not charity, it's wages. What are they bothered by? Well, if you read between the lines, don't we have the right to eat and drink? Well, I guess he spends too much on food. Maybe he was overweight and he could have eaten less, you know? Don't we have the right, verse 5, to take along a believing wife? Actually, that says a sister, a wife. It's a quotation from Song of Solomon which everybody loves to say is never quoted in the rest of Scripture, that's false. It's quoted right here, a sister, a wife. <laughs> we have no right to take a, a wife, right? A sister, a wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. The other apostles and Peter and even Jesus' brothers, they had wives that they were taking along. What does it mean? It means they were being supported enough that they had a family. They supported their family. They were Their payment was enough to take care of their family. As he said, do we have no right to take along the wife? We have no right to eat and drink. We have no right to take the wife. Or is it only Barnabas and I, verse 6, who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Well, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. That is true, but preaching is working. He's not saying, I would like to be fed at public expense. <laughs> He's just saying, shouldn't there be the ability to make a living? He's, there's a lot of things in here, actually, that talk about it, but it, it does get down to that, the seventh verse, who serves as a soldier at his own expense. It's just not how it works. You do have to be compensated for doing the work because you have legitimate expenses in life. Everybody does. Everybody needs money. Food and drink, a wife, which implies children. Some right to refrain from working for a living. Does this mean vacation, retirement? It might, but I, I think he's talking about the fact that, as is recorded later, we'll talk about it, he's actually working a secular job at the same time. 
to pay his own way and the way of the others who are serving with him and preaching the gospel. And it's just not the way things are done. What soldier serves at his own expense? Who plants the vineyard and doesn't eat the fruit? Who tends the flock and doesn't drink the milk? No. Yeah, that's not how things are done. And he said at the 11th verse, if we've sown spiritual things among you, is it too much to reap material things from you? The 14th verse, I think very important. In the same way as the Levites were commanded to get a tithe from their brethren, so also the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Now, I do not mean by this that I expect to see brethren coming to services next week with sheep and uh, carts, cart loads of grain. <laughs> okay. That's not what he means. He's just saying there were people then who were dedicated to working for God, to working the word of God, the spiritual work, who did not have the ability to provide for themselves secular employment because they literally did not have inheritances of lands and fields. They didn't have the, the animals. They didn't have the land to work. They had to be provided those things by the rest of the tribes in order to dedicate themselves to this very important work of the word of God, the righteousness of God to making sure that they are keeping the calendar, that they're observing the festivals, to, that they're offering their sacrifices to the teaching. All these things are very worth supporting. And it was the commandment in those times. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel get a living from the gospel. It's fairly plain that you have to compensate people who are doing the work of the Lord or they won't have the time to do the work of the Lord. <laughs> That's basically it. The Levites didn't have the fields because they couldn't be working the temple service of sacrifices and teaching and working the field at the same time. That's all he's saying. And it's fairly straightforward, I think. But when you fast forward to 2 Corinthians 11, He writes about his time there. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you, Corinth. And I when I was with you and I was in need at that time, I didn't burden anyone there at Corinth. The brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. And yet, you know, you look back at 1 Corinthians and the things that he has to defend, he said, it's my defense to those who would examine me. He's answering their questions. Is he allowed to eat? Does he eat too much? Is he allowed to have a family? Well, he doesn't actually. He doesn't have a wife and children. <laughs> Is he allowed to stop working? Right, all these things. They were complaining about that. They were complaining that he was expensive, and yet the money came from the Macedonians. At Corinth, they didn't want to give up anything. They didn't want to support him. And they didn't. And Macedonia did. But Macedonia, we read, were impoverished. Why should they be the ones who are supporting Paul to preach in the wealthy city-state of Corinth. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, it doesn't make financial sense, but it makes spiritual sense. Corinth was not ready. They were not mature. They were not strong. They were largely, they were not faithful. Read 1 Corinthians. It's not a place where you would place membership if you had a choice. Let's just be real now. If I went to a city and there was a church like Corinth and there was another church that I knew to be faithful, no chance I would darken the door of Corinth. Look at the stuff that they struggled with in 1 Corinthians.
But who's going to do the work? Well, Paul's going to do the work, but I mean, who is really going to empower that? Who is going to enable that? Who's going to send him? Well, the Macedonians did. The Macedonians did it. They fed the needy saints in Jerusalem. They fed Paul and those who were preaching the gospel in Greece. You know, there were people who obeyed the gospel in Acts 17. You remember he's in in Athens, he's at Mars Hill. And there's people who obey the gospel. Those people, they owe something to Macedonia, don't they? Because Macedonia fed Paul while he was in Athens. They owe something to him, right? They were the workers, Macedonia. They say the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. I say Macedonia is the powerhouse of the New Testament church. Macedonia is powerful. This is an interesting thing to think about. They are impoverished. They are poor by 2 Corinthians 8. Literally. And yet they're the ones who partnered with Paul. Look at Philippi in Philippians chapter 4. All right, Philippians 4. It's 10 through 19, really. But look at what they did here. And you do have to read this. I know it's lengthy, but you got to understand what he's saying. This passage, you know, is not about, uh, well, we can overcome physical circumstances by spiritual strength. Although that is true and that is a theme, that's not what he's talking about. He's literally talking about the fact that they fed him while he was traveling and preaching in Greece. So he was writing to them in retrospect of having received money from Philippi. He says in Philippi 4, Philippians 4, verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now, after a, a long time, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned, but you had no opportunity. And we know that that's true. As he said, he can testify they were impoverished. They, they simply couldn't for a time, but they've done it again. They're back on. Now, not that I speak of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am found to be content. But Paul said, I, I'm not writing about need, in part because when you are sending somebody to preach, you are paying them to do work. It's not charity. And in part because, as he said, Well, it's just going to be what it is. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and facing hunger, facing abundance and facing need. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. So he leaves Macedonia, goes to Greece. None of them are in partnership with him, giving and receiving. Just Philippi, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So even before he got out of Macedonia, when he was preaching in Thessalonica and there wasn't enough support, Philippi supported him. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's very clear what he's talking about. They supported him preaching the gospel. And at first Thessalonica couldn't do it, and Philippi took care of that. And in, and in Greece, they took care of it. He spread the word in Greece. He spread the word in many places because 
in part, he was partnered up with the powerhouse of Macedonia, <laughs> which you would never, nobody would ever say that looking at that congregation because they were poor. They were impoverished. But they were a powerhouse, weren't they? Look what they did. Look what they empowered, what they made happen. All these famous places, all these famous letters of the New Testament. They were made, par- made possible in part by a grant from Philippi. <laughs> That's what's happening. So we notice, especially in Philippians 4, as we have noted here, that the church entered into partnership with Paul in giving and receiving. So this giving and receiving, as in they're sending him support to preach the gospel, is a partnership. They are working together. This is what he means by, I don't seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your credit. They are getting credit for the work that he is doing. They are partners in spreading the gospel. That's what I mean by saying this. They they are due a certain share of uh, the credit for the spread of the gospel in the first century because they funded Paul throughout Greece and beyond. And they preserved the saints in Jerusalem alive, in part. Everybody gave, I understand. I don't want to oversell what Macedonia has done, but to say they did a lot. They partnered up with Paul. They they should be recognized for the fact that they are working with him. The good that he does and the teaching that he does is in part their good and their teaching because they supported it. And they were kind he said, I don't write about need. And, you know, when I know you didn't, you weren't able, literally not able to send money. Yet, it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, they just plain had a concern about Paul's trouble. But when he says it was kind of you to share my trouble, on the one hand, they're kind and, and they're loving as brethren ought to be. But on the other hand, it's not charity. It's, you know, the fact that he needs help. Well, maybe he would ask them for help if he needed it. And maybe they would give it, and maybe they wouldn't if they could, and they couldn't, whatever. But because he was troubled, it was even more urgent that they start up again their support for him. It was kind of you to share my trouble. That's what he means by that. And I wanted to focus in, too, on some of these things. This is what I found most surprising in the latest study, the latest time through this, the latest iteration. When he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. You know, these words about, you know, facing plenty, facing hunger, uh, being brought low and abounding. What does it mean? This means he had less than he needed sometimes. And it also means he had more than he needed sometimes. There were circumstances when there was not enough support. He was struggling. There wasn't money to cover their expenses. And, you know, if you think about it, if you know any faithful preachers, you know that you have seen those times. That happens. But the text equally and in a balanced way presents alongside this plenty and abundance. Sometimes Paul had more than he needed. In fact, the vocabulary here, when he says, I'm I'm well supplied, this is the word for fattening cattle. (laughs) I laugh a little about it because we're not saying that you want everybody you support to be fat and happy. That's not what we're talking about. But it's a funny way of describing this because what he's saying is sometimes you do have more than you need. And my question is, man, I read that and I realized what he's saying, that, that he's got what he needs and he has more than he needs right now. Philippi sent him money because they were concerned about him and he, he actually didn't need it. 
He's oversupplied. And the first thing that came to my mind was, man, I don't remember the last time a faithful gospel preacher had more money than he needed. I don't remember that. But they did in that time. Now, that was interesting to me. We all know about the ones that have less than they need. (laughs) But I don't remember the last time I saw them having more than they needed. Although I have heard of this, actually. Um, I've heard of this at least twice. I I heard of a a preacher in, in, um, well, in West Texas, in one of the the cities in West Texas, um, who was being, you know, compensated at a fairly high level of compensation. Um, And I heard about this because I heard about the conversation that was had in the local congregation that somebody was complaining about how much money that guy was making. And the other fellow said, yeah, and can you believe it? He supports three other gospel preachers from his income. What a deal that we are getting. I'm told that this is true of another place in in another large city in Texas where a man is compensated fairly well. I'm told that he supports two or three other men. And, you know, the thing about that is it's actually quite biblical. When you look at Acts 20, there's a lot of clues. It's quite biblical, actually, this idea that we know somebody, we trust somebody, um, you know, we have some interaction with them. We know them to be trustworthy and faithful stewards of the truth of God. And maybe they have more than they need. They have extra. As Paul was trusted by Philippi, and he had more than he needed for a time. Not all the time, but at that point he did. Well, what did he do with that? Was he good for it? Was he trustworthy with that? You know, did he go buy a Cadillac, you know? <laughs> well, they didn't have Cadillacs back then. I don't know. Must have been some fancy chariots or something, I mean. You know. No, 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 no. But really, they enabled something, right? In Acts 20, when you look at what Paul tells the elders at Ephesus, he said to them at 2034, you yourselves know these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. He provided it by working. He had a secular job as a tent maker, you may know this, and he did do that. And in the times when he didn't have enough from Philippi, of course he was working with his hands. Perhaps he was working at the time that he received this money from Philippi, and that's why he had more than he needed. What did he do with it? He also supported those who were preaching alongside him. There were other preachers traveling with him who were faithful, and they were being supported. Macedonia enabled the spread of the gospel, the true gospel, the faithful gospel, those who traveled with Paul because he was faithful. So there is precedent for that. I heard those stories about those uh, brothers who maybe were doing just fine. Um, and they're probably true. It looks like that's what Paul did when he had extra. He gave it to people who were working in the gospel and needed it. The other thing that you're seeing, 2 Corinthians 8, is that, you know, going back to this idea, or I guess revisiting this, the other thing that I'm seeing is not just that you know, Macedonia is powerful, but the the grace and the power actually belongs to God. And you're seeing there at 2 Corinthians 8, he said to them at verse 9, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, after reminding them about what Macedonia, or letting them in on what happened with Philippi and Macedonia, he says, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. 
Well, Jesus is the one who put us first, right? It's the grace of the Lord. He was gracious to us. Jesus, you know, as we just sang, he left that throne of glory. He, he left heaven to come walk the earth among us. And he died a horrible death that we might have forgiveness of our sins. He died the penalty. He took the penalty that was due to us. That's grace. And that's gracious. Though he was rich for our sake, he became poor that we might become rich in him. Jesus set an example for us that we are to be like this in our attitude and in our heart. It's grace and it's power through the Lord. And again, in Acts 20, revisiting that idea that Paul said to them, um, remember there at verse 34, well, it's really 33. Acts 20, verse 33, beginning, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know these hands ministered to my necessities and to the necessities of those who were with me. In all things I have showed you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, it was Jesus who said this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He certainly gave all, we know that. But did you catch what Paul said there? When I was there among you in Ephesus, I paid my way and the way of those with me. So his working night and day, as he wrote in Thessalonica, is what he's talking about at verse 35. I've shown you in all things that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. The churches that did not support him were not supporting him because they were weak. He was helping the weak. And Jesus did just as much, who saved us when we were not able, who died for us while we were yet sinners, right? So this, you know, having put these things together, I started to make this observation and I think it's true, so I'll share it with you. Have observations. First one is the, the positive one. The second is going to be the negative, of course. But the first one is that support always comes from someone to whom God is more important than money. That's the truth of the matter in the New Testament. Support will come. Where is it going to come from? It's going to come from somebody to whom God is more important than money. Notice it's not necessarily coming from someone who has a lot of money. That's what we read. What we read was that Philippi supported Paul when he preached in the wealthy city-states of Greece, not Greece. And the Greeks still complained about the cost, as recorded in 1 Corinthians 9. No, support's going to come from somebody to whom God is more important than money. They were impoverished. They gave beyond their means. They supported Paul because he was faithful and they knew it, because he was teaching the gospel and they knew it. They'd been forgiven of their sins and they wanted others to be forgiven of their sins. That was more important to them. And that's how it always is. This is going to come from somebody. Not always the person for whom it is convenient, for whom it is easy or an afterthought, but it's going to come and it's going to be the person to whom it's more important. God is more important to them. Remember what he said in Acts 20, 35, I've shown you by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Paul was dedicated to supporting these nascent churches. They were brand new in the the Lord. They had just begun the first thing in their whole country that was anything like the church, that was anything like this. And he knew that they were weak and they needed to be helped. So he didn't accept money from them at that time. He allowed the money to come from other places. 
Although Philippi was just as new, but they're just kind of crazy. <laughs> they're just determined to do this. And that's kind of cool. But he said, he's working hard. He's working night and day, right? He's got his secular work. He's got his preaching work and he's not taking the money from them. That's helping the weak. He himself is taking the abuse to make sure that they get the truth of the gospel. And Jesus said this too. It's more blessed to give than to receive, Acts 20, 35, right? That, that's, what, that's the way that the Lord set the example. We talked about it. He paid much more than any of us have. He told Corinth, remember 2 Corinthians eleven eight. I robbed other churches accepting support from them in order to serve you. It was more important to those other churches than it was to Corinth at the time. That's what he's saying. They gave beyond their means, 2 Corinthians 8, 3. And that of their own accord. We didn't press them for this. They chose to do this. They demanded to do this. It was a, it was a, a pleasure. It was a privilege to participate in the relief of the saints. From their perspective, that's how Macedonia looked at it. And yes, Jesus, though he was rich, became poor for our sakes, as we read in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, right? These are people, you know, Paul, Philippi, Jesus, the Son of God, these are all people for whom God is more important than money. God is more important than self. And that's where the support comes from. On the other hand, Support never comes from somebody for whom money is more important than God. If somebody thinks the money is more important, uh, and is, is the point, is the key, is the, is the, the pivotal factor, they're never going to part with it. They're going to hold on to that and keep it under their control as long as they possibly can. It will never come, no matter how much of it they have, no matter how easy it would be. It's just not going to come out. They won't let it go. That's 1 Corinthians 9. Paul preached for free, and that wasn't good enough. <laughs> They're complaining about the cost. <laughs> They're examining him. He wants to take along a family. Why? He shouldn't have a family. Why not? He's working. I mean, he learns things. I've certainly learned things from my good wife. In fact, anything useful that I say here has always been things that Emily said to me. <laughs> I don't come up with anything good on my own. And the children have taught me as well, of course. Uh, there's great benefit in having somebody who has the experience of having a family. I don't think that's worth... Uh, you know, questioning or, or blinking at, I think it's worth it. You're getting something for that. No right to refrain from working for a living. You know, they just, though there's plenty, though there's enough available, they're just not willing to support Paul with it. In fact, 2 Corinthians 12, 16 reveals that there were accusations even after the first letter where he answered all their questions about support. There was an accusation. He said, I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by deceit. And that's the one that we want to look at finally because that's the place where you're finding that, you know, Paul is not taking money in Greece because he wants to undermine and undercut the false teachers in Greece who would like to claim, 2 Corinthians eleven twelve that they work on the same terms as we do. Well, they don't. And I'm going to demonstrate that by not accepting any money. That's what he decided to do in that place at that time. But don't think that it means he didn't take any money. He did. He took it from Philippi. And yet their accusation was, well, you know, you got it another way. And in that passage there at 2 Corinthians 12, at verse 18, he said, I sent Titus to you, I sent Timothy to you. Did they act differently? Didn't we take the same steps? Everybody working with Paul, traveling with him, 
Acts 20, 34, I met my, my hands met my needs and the needs of those traveling with me. They did the same thing at Corinth. They wouldn't take the money. They know it's true. That's why he said it. <laughs> they know that that's true. <laughs> but how are we working? Who's going to do the work? Who is going to accept the slander? Like Paul did. Like Jesus did. Who's going to join hands with the Lord and do the work, come what may? Those are the things that I found on the second go-round, or well, no, not second, however many go-rounds this has been now, but just in restudying this. The brothers who came from Macedonia are showing us that our heart is really central in our support for the work of the Lord. Not so much, uh, yeah, some for the brother himself who maybe we take pity on and his circumstances. And, you know, I would say you should take pity on, on my wife, not on me. You know, keep, keep her in your prayers. But um, more, I think, about the heart of what about the people who have never heard of Jesus? What about the people who need the truth, who need to have an insistence on book, chapter, and verse, who need to be taught how to serve God, how to worship, how to, to perform discipline in the local church, how to repent. Our hearts need to go out to them. And in part, that happens by us sending and supporting preachers. That's how it works. Well, that's what I found I hope that you'll find those things to be biblical and encouraging. And I think it's true in the times when we've been able to help brothers who are preaching and have brothers come and speak to us in a meeting, gospel meeting. Um, we've been partners together. And I think that good things have come from that and spiritual benefit has come from that. And it's been well worth it, I would say. Well, today, are you a Christian? That's well worth it. There's costs that we pay in life, it's true, but you know, they're all worth it because there's glory coming in the Lord. And uh, God is going to pay us back and God is going to get us back And when this life is done. And it's not very long, not very long from now. He'll get it. He will take care of us. And we'll take care of each other too. You know, when you become a Christian, you are becoming a part of God's family. And God's people, although there are some instances in which they are the worst people you can think of, because, well, that's what the devil would do. They're the most useful. The fact is, by, as a rule, they're the best people in the world. They're the kindest and most generous people, and you're going to find that there are people who want to help you, the people who want to encourage you, who want to build you up. And it's a good thing to become a Christian. And it's a good life to live a Christian life. There's water here prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, if that is today your need. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Well, change the heart. Serve God from now on. Let's hold each other's hands up in the gospel and go forward in the Lord. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <clears throat>